Good afternoon. I hope everybody is well today. I cannot remember if I made this setting public. Hey, Linda, how are you? I am. It's, you know, our kind of cold is not everybody else's cold, but I'm cold this morning. I got a fire going and I'm cold. So I wore my snuggly. And I'm having passion. Look at the color on that tea. Can y'all see that tea? It's that Tezo passion fruit. It is the most beautiful color. I love it. It's got hibiscus flowers in it. So is our broadcast clear? And I cannot remember if I made this public. I hope that I did. I don't know that I did, but I hope I did. I don't know. Can y'all tell? Or is it just showing, showing to my friends? Because I know a lot of folks watch that are not necessarily friends on Facebook. Anyway, I love you guys. We are going to go to part two of, um, I titled this Cleaning Out the Pantry last week um so we're gonna do a part two and and finish this up and next week he's already the lord's already given me the mess the not the message the bible study for next week i've already got a good beginning on it so i'm excited about that but is the broadcast clear can y'all is everything working well it's hard for me to tell sometimes Hello. How's it doing? I'm going to wait until I can see a comment or something. So if I need to restart it, I can do that. Okay. Oh, good. Very clear. Thank you, Linda. Thank you so much. Okay. So last week, thanks, Brigitte. Last week, um, I began with covering that the fact that God is the ruler of all. He is sovereign. He was the creator. He has a plan. Um, and yeah, I know that I cover that a lot, but it, it, it's basic 101 Christianity. We've got to know that God is in control. And how does God speak to us? He speaks to us through the word. If you're not in the Word, you're not hearing from God. And uh, that's been a really um, serious deception in modern times in the church. People feel like they're going to get all these brand new revelations. Um, that sounds really great, but the point is that the Bible is not being rewritten. The Word of God is written and it's for us today and it's accurate for today. And so, any well, we're going to cover this so I don't want to jump the gun here, but anytime you hear something, somebody say they've got some brand new revelation from God, be careful. Be careful. Um, so, again, we covered sovereignty last week. We talked about how God designed and ordained things from the beginning. Those things do not change. We went over Psalms 103. Um, and, I, and I spent a lot of time on that. So today, we are going to talk about how to clean out our pantry and keep it clean. Oh, good. Yay, Suzanne. I love you. Um... I shared with y'all last week that one of my January things, my big, my big thing in January is to organize, clean out closets, clean out my pantry, get my sewing room straightened up. Because usually after Christmas, after all the holidays are over, I have a mess. The house has just gotten into a mess because of all the projects I've been working on, all the activities, family being here. Just things can kind of get 
messed up and out of order. And I love to take January, and it's usually not the time of year that I can do a lot of stuff outside in the garden and all. So I take January to get myself back in order, get everything ready to begin a new year. And, and if you're not an organizer by nature, let January be your kickoff time to get your home organized. As a homemaker, a mother and a wife, you need order. There needs to be order in your home. And I know a lot of folks joke about it that they're just, you know, they just love their mess and they can find things better if it's a mess. And, you know, that sounds cute and all that. But I'm telling you, the daughter of God needs to be an orderly woman. She doesn't need to be chaos. Reminds me of that little boy on the Peanuts cartoon. He walks around just dirty and he's got the little, little flies buzzing all around him and, you know, he's cute. Well, not, mm -mm, we don't need to be that way. Um, in talking about your pantry, and I'm just using that as an example, that's where you accumulate, right? That's where your food storage is, maybe your cookware, um, things that you use in your home day in and day out. Your pantry it may be where you keep your flour and your baking ingredients or your canned goods or um, even your cleaning supplies. The thought process here is to focus on what you're storing up, what you're keeping within yourself, in your spiritual walk, in your mind, in your will, in your emotions, all of those things. Let's call that your pantry. What are you storing in your pantry? How does your pantry look? Is it time to empty your pantry, your spiritual and emotional life, clear things out and reorder? and focus on what is needful and make all of those things that you're storing up within yourself are scriptural. They're of God. We're going to go through some steps. And the first one, Courtney says, my prayer request, ladies, is my trust to get set up and approved quickly. I found a car in waiting. Courtney, that's all I can read, and I will read that later, but... but. I am praying for you and, and daily pray for you. Um, the first thing that popped in my spirit when I was making this list was when I go to the store and I'm going to buy something food-wise for my family, I always, in my mind, I think, well, is it good for me? Is it healthy? I don't want to bring unhealthy stuff. I stopped buying a bunch of chocolate. I used to love to buy chocolate. I don't buy a lot of cookies anymore. I just keep, you know, just something in the house for the grandbabies. Um, so I've tried to get more serious about things. So I ask myself, is this healthy? Is this item that I'm looking at good for me? And, um, you know, stores hire consultants about how to set their store up to make you buy on a whim, to make you buy on impulse. And spirit, the devil loves to do that too. He loves to bring things into our daily walk that will entice us, not for godliness, the devil is never going to draw you with something that'll make you more godly. So if you feel your flesh being pulled towards something because it looks good or feels good or sounds good, that's that's a beginning indication that it 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 may be an impulse. And when I say sounds good, I mean to your flesh. If it's going to in any way make your flesh really, really happy, it's probably not healthy for you spiritually. There's a lot of teachers and teaching, a lot of women, Father forgive us, preachers and teachers that they look really great. They're physically very beautiful. They just seem to have it all together and they just are so eloquent. And and of course, then they're going to sell you some books and and maybe even they'll sell the cosmetics that make them so pretty and their new shampoo that they've developed. And 
And when it starts getting into all of that stuff, you, you should be hearing sirens go off. You should be seeing red flags waving at the wind because any anyone who is teaching a, is a Bible teacher that is wooing your flesh and encouraging carnality shouldn't be. Can you imagine Jesus walking around telling you to uh, go buy this new shampoo or wearing some beautiful new um, winter ensemble to make you look better? I don't think so. I don't think Jesus spent one iota of time trying to encourage people to look their best. Don't you want to look pretty today? Try this new lipstick I found. Wow, it's going to just make you wonderful. No, the world is beating us all the time in that direction. What we need is the spirit man to be beautiful. We need the spirit within us to be fed and to grow and to increase. The more attention that is paid on the external the less time you've got for the internal. And I know a lot of people disagree with that. And you know what? That's okay. You can disagree with that statement. But I encourage you, if you disagree with that statement, find the scripture to back up your belief. I'd be really interested. Now, there are some scriptures in the Old Testament where the um, some of the women of the Old Testament adorned themselves. But I think if you'll really read those scriptures, you'll see that it was not something God was approving of and it didn't necessarily lead to godly behavior. Um, so I'm just saying that when you're looking at things to add into your spiritual pantry you're, when you're um, coming up with the criteria of what you believe, don't go on a whim. Now, we're going to look at some scriptures. And like I said, you need to always be able to back up what you're thinking, what you're believing with the scripture. Human opinion and conjecture is worthless completely. My opinion and your opinion is worthless Proverbs fourteen twelve, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the, way of the, are the ways of death. It seems good. It seems right. It seems to make sense. And yeah, I know there's not really a scripture about it, but just looking at it logically, I think God would have okayed this. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. 1 John 2.16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now, you can't get much more clear than that right there. 1 John 2.16, for all that is in the world... The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. I have really tried to remove the phrase, I'm so proud of dot, dot, dot. I don't. I don't want to say, oh, I'm so proud of you, or I'm so proud of that. I've tried, and I'm, I'm sure that I still fail, but I've tried to remove that word from my vocabulary when expressing being pleased in something because I don't want it to ever, I don't want pride to rear its head in even the slightest way in my thinking. The pride of life, you, there's a difference between contentment and joy in what's going on in your life because of what God has done and pride over something. You know, I, I could easily in that worldly sense say, oh, I'm so proud of, um, 
I'm so proud of my daughters and my son. I'm so proud of them. And the concept is okay. But I don't want to take my view of pride. So I have converted that statement. I'm not proud. I am blessed. And when I say I am blessed, yes, it's a small little thing that probably doesn't mean a hill of beans to anybody. But when I say I am blessed, that takes that focus off of me and reminds me where that came from. I am blessed with my children. Yeah, yeah, a small thing. But a reminder to the devil and to anyone else who's listening that I understand that my God is God. And it's because of his hand that the things are there in my life. So we need to really examine those things that are in our spiritual pantry. Things that we say, things that we do. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. James 1, 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You, you cannot have it both ways. You cannot have it where you just love this world and you love God too. We can't. I mean, I have wonderful, beautiful things in my home that, oh, they just, they're just such a joy to my heart. But, you know, there's been a lot of people in this world who love their home, their furnishings, their the place where they they hung their hat and they came home the next day and it was all gone. And did they love God just as much afterward? Some did, some didn't. Would you well I'll just I'll just share with you a little thing. Right now Livia is is going through a few little trials. You know, they got married back in November and um and everything is so happy there. But you know, things like water pipe bursting, um car messing up, dogs getting out of the pen, all those those not life changing things, but just little aggravations that happen and we were talking about it. And, you know, she's strong in her faith. And I encouraged her. I said, look, the devil just trying to steal your peace and your joy. But in order for her to latch on to the word of God, there had to be something already planted in there. And so when these trials come, you got to have that. You've got to have the scripture. You've got to have the faith. You've got to have everything deep down in you because the devil will try to snatch the rug right out from under you. So if you've only stored candy in the pantry, in your spiritual pantry, if you've only stored those happy little cheerful little scriptures and not the real meat scriptures that, that are going to sustain you, do you know what I mean? There's preachers and teachers out there that everything's wonderful. And no, we don't talk about sin because that just makes people feel bad. And, and you know, if you'll, if you'll pass this Facebook message on to 10 people next week, you are going to get all your prayers answered. Lie from the pit of hell. It doesn't work that way. But when we store that up in us, even the thought somewhere in the back of our mind of those things, when the devil comes to attack us, we we don't have a bit of strength. Because back there in our in our head, the devil's saying, yeah, God doesn't love you. He doesn't love you any better than so-and-so loved you. And he doesn't care about you in the least. And, and look what's happening now. You just need to forget this. It's a waste of time. When your spiritual pantry gets filled up with junk, that's all you got when the trials come. James 4, 8. 
Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. It works. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Educate yourself in Scripture. Think about the truth of the walk. Nobody can address the truth of your walk with God except you. There could be, you, you could have dinner with the top 50 prophets and teachers of the last 2,000 years. You can sit down at a table with them and have a meal and talk about things. But nobody can address the truth of your heart except you and God. So when I was cleaning out my pantry and I was looking at things, I had I had things in that pantry that I know had to have been 10 years old. It is my habit that when I get a staple like oatmeal or or cornmeal or grits or whatever it is, I empty it out of the box that it comes in or bag that it comes in. I put it in a clear container and you know put an airtight lid on it so that it will stay fresh and so I can see that it's there and see the the amount that I have and as I was cleaning out that pantry the other day I had some Scottish oat bran that I bought probably 10 years ago thinking, oh, this is going to be so great. I'm going to cook this, and it's going to be wonderful. And Or Scottish oatmeal. And, and I think I cooked it one time and just did not care for it. But I didn't throw it away. I kept it. I don't know why I kept it, but I kept it. And this jar of Scottish oatmeal, whatever it was, has been sitting in my pantry for 10 years. Now, there wasn't any weevils in it, and I'm sure the taste may have been off a little, but it would have saved us in a starving situation. But as I was pouring it into the bucket to take to the chickens, I just kept hearing, why are you holding on to old stuff? Why are you holding on to something just because it sounded good at the time? Ladies, we hold on to things. I'm not talking about truths. I'm not talking about scriptural truths. I'm talking about things that were just a flash in the pan spiritually. And it just, it really made sense and it sounded so good. And, and surely that's going to be the missing link to me having great victory in my spiritual walk. And I just keep that stuff in the back of my my mind and over time things get cluttered things get confusing because when the Lord does reveal a truth in scripture that goes against something that you heard some preacher say 25 years ago that sounded really good let me tell you scripture always wins scripture always wins Again, remember, my opinion, your opinion, somebody else's opinion doesn't make a hill of beans. Scripture is the truth. So when you are thinking about dealing with the stuff that you're, you're keeping within yourself, don't go with things just because they were a whim and you've held on to them for a long time. Now, I can't tell you specifics. I could probably sit here for two days telling you specific ideas, but the Lord will reveal it to you. The Holy Spirit will reveal it to you. The next thing is, oh, look, this is on sale. I'm going to buy a bunch of this and stock up, put this in my pantry. So as I was thinking about my pantry and I was cleaning it out and saw these sale items that I had bought and never used. You know, it's sort of funny because I, I remember reading a food pantry, like a, a charity food pantry. 
they were talking about needing food, that their shelves were getting low and it was coming up on the holidays and they really needed to replenish their storage so they could help folks. And they, they were talking about that and they said, please, please, you know, don't give us anything like um, hominy or what was the other thing? It was something like, oh, I can't think of what it was right now, but it was something that nobody eats. It's on the shelf at the grocery store, but nobody eats that stuff, and they had tons of it. And as I was thinking about what they were saying, I thought, yeah, that's what happened. Somebody, it was on sale somewhere, and some well-intentioned woman decided she's going to buy this stuff and use it for her family because it's at a really good price. And so she stocked up, got it home. They took one bite of it, couldn't stand it, and so she donated it to the community food pantry. When things are easily attained and very cheap, that's usually what they're worth. Very little. When there's something hard won, hard fought for, that's taken you time and diligence and sacrifice, and it's caused you stretching in your character and in your spirit to attain, that is what's valuable. Those are the things that will stay in your pantry and do you some good. You know, when, when you're diabetic, simple sugars quickly raise your blood sugar. I mean, things like sugar and chocolate and ice cream raises your sugar very quickly. And it's it's um, a learning experience when you become diabetic because you think, oh, you can't have any more sugar. Gonna raise your blood sugar, terrible for you. When in fact, it's the things like complex carbs, like bread, and rice and potatoes and pasta, those are the real bad stuff. Because not only do they raise your sugar fairly quickly, because it takes so long for your system to digest and clear that, it keeps your sh blood sugar high for a long period of time. So my point in sharing that is, we can quickly detect when something is coming to us as an angel of light. It sounds good, but really we know it goes against scripture and it's really not something we need to absorb into our spiritual walk. But there are also things that are thrown to us that are twisted up a little bit. And right now in our society, There is a lot of stuff getting put out there that sounds outstanding, amazingly charitable and godly and good, and we need to support that and we need to back this up. But, and, and you know, on surface value, you can't argue with it. But when you begin to delve deeper and really study, you see where the error seeps in. So, if something is easily attained, it's literally a spiritual sale item, flash sale, blue light special. Look at this great revelation I've just discovered. Back up. Back up. Don't feel your spirit. Don't feel, there goes my southern F-I-L-L. -L. Don't fill your spirit with cheap spiritual gimmicks. They're not going to help you. They're not going to strengthen you. They're going to waste your energy. And then in the battle time, you're going to have nothing because it's not going to be meat. You need meat. Matthew 13, 45 and 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. One pearl of great price is far better than a thousand pearls that are worth nothing. And, and the devil is strewing thousands of shiny pearls all over the place. 
Now, if you're having trouble equating what I'm saying to the truth in spirit, I'm praying for you because I know sometimes when when I talk about um, parallels this way, sometimes if you're busy and you're, you're working, got kids running around, it's hard to figure out what exactly the point is. But I'm telling you, be aware that there's lots of things out there to draw your attention away from the deep things of God. Things that will make you feel really good. Things that will make you focus on the flesh. Things that will soothe your emotions for the moment. That's why folks, you know, seek worldly entertainment. It's amusement. It's to block your brain. Paul and I decided many years ago not to, we removed television. We didn't have any televisions in our house. We actually had one in our schoolroom building because there were, you know, movies and things I wanted the kids to watch for school, documentaries, and we had all kind of educational movies and, well, not really movies, but um, you know what I'm talking about, like, Educational documentaries. Anyway, we had that down in the schoolroom building that was separate from our house. We had not watched television like for entertainment in probably a year or more. And a young neighbor that we loved dearly, she was maybe 22 or 23 years old, attended church with us. And um, she had two very small children and went to the doctor one day and she was sick and they ran a bunch of tests and told her she had leukemia and she was dead within two weeks. It was a nightmare. It, it was so horrible for everyone that knew them, knew the family. It was devastating because she had gone from a healthy, young, 20-something-year-old girl that loved to ride around the neighborhood on a bicycle and had her little babies, and she was just full of life and loved the Lord, and she got sick one day and was dead two weeks later from leukemia. And, and I'm telling you, it jarred us to the core. And Paul was the pallbearer in the funeral. After the funeral was over, we all went home, and it was like we were shell-shocked. We were sitting in the living room just shell-shocked. And one of us, I don't know if it was me or Paul, said, you know, the kids, the kids were just very upset. And I said, or Paul said, I don't remember which one, said, let's just go get the TV and bring it up and watch something. Let the girls watch something and just give our minds and our hearts a little break. And we did that. I don't remember what we watched. It may have been Swiss Family Robinson. It may have been the Ten Commandments. I mean, it may have it, it would not have been something ungodly, but just something to give our our brains something to focus on. And and you know, I've never forgotten that. Because at that time, we were so hurt, so weak, so sad. And none of us, even Paul and I at the time, could not spiritually grab hold of a foothold to pull us out. Now, obviously, within a day, we realized and we were back on track. But at that moment, the distress was so strong we couldn't we couldn't come to grips with it and I, I i have used that as an example for myself now all these years to think angie don't let yourself get so emotionally hindered that you cannot find peace and you need to reach for that worldly entertainment. Do y'all know what I mean? 
And that really was a changing point for me, and I think it was for Paul too, that we realized we still had not attained that place we wanted to be in. And, and so now the thought of, of reaching for some crutch to make us feel better when we're at a low spot, we know better. We're prepared. We're stronger than that now. But at the time, we really weren't. And that's what I'm talking about. Easily attained peace. Easily attained cheerfulness or happiness or, or comfort that feels, F-I-L-L-S, your heart, your emotions for the moment is not going to be what you need for the real struggles. And I don't know about you, but everybody I know has real struggles. Um, Philippians 4.19 But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. We all know that scripture. But how often do you pull that back up when you're in the midst of a struggle? Yes, I am weak right now. I am overwhelmed. I am hurting, Lord. But my God shall supply all my needs. My God shall supply all my needs. Right now, Lord, I need peace. Right now, Lord, I need to know that you are on the throne taking care of this problem. Right now, Lord, I feel lonely. And I need to know that you're already preparing to remedy that situation in my life. Right now, Lord, I don't know what to do about this child that is driving me completely insane. Lord, show me that you're going to help me in this. My God shall supply all my need in relationships, financially, if your car's messing up, if you don't have any food in the house, if, if your pipe's busted, if your dog is running around the neighborhood and you can't find it. My God shall supply all my need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. That does not mean that every answer is going to be there written in beautiful calligraphy script in the mail today. We expect that, we want that, and when it doesn't happen, we feel unhappy. But the truth is, my God shall supply all my needs, not my wants. 1 Corinthians 6.20 For ye are brought, bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Your body and your spirit are not yours. They are God's. So, when you feel like, oh, look at this great new idea. Look at this great new um the uh, teaching, oh, I love this teaching because it says I can do this and this and this. And God wants me to have beautiful things. And he wants me to have fun experiences. And, and God loves me and he's not going to deny me anything. Ye are bought with a price. Therefore. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Not a new revelation. That's old truth. Still holds today. Are y'all with me? 1 Peter 3, 4. But let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So what does God value? What does God value? A meek and quiet spirit, incorruptible things in your heart. That needs to be what you value, what I value. The older I get, the less I talk, which is kind of funny because sometimes I think 
I just need to completely sew my lips together and just not talk at all. I can understand somebody wanting to take a vow of silence. That would be my greatest sacrifice. But I do think if God values this, this is what I should value. It shouldn't be the sweet, easy, junk food, spiritual stuff. It should be the deep stuff. Okay, following every new idea. Yes, sometimes new ideas are good, but every day there's a new idea. Every day somebody comes up with a brand new diet, a new way to exercise, a new way to eat, a new concept. And if we fill up our spiritual pantry with every new thing that comes down the pike, the old gets thrown out. I'm not talking about the old doctrines that were not truth. I'm not talking about the, the old things that came up as new ideas. I'm talking about the tradition based on scripture that has stood the test of time, brought fruit from the Lord, and is confirmed in Scripture. Those are the truths I'm talking about. When you get all this new stuff in, new stuff, new stuff, new stuff, the old truth gets hindered because you're trying to do all this new stuff. And 99.9% .9 of all these new revelations, new ideas, new thought processes, new do this, new do that, are feeding somebody's flesh. I see things right now in my mind. I, I, I could give you list after list of stuff like I'm talking about, but I don't like to throw everything out there at once because somebody will lock on to it and get their feelings hurt or get offended and say, well, that's just not true because, you know, my pastor does that or my favorite Sunday school teacher does that or my mom does this or, or, my si or I do this and I'm fine. I love God. We must examine by scripture and examine the fruit to know whether a teaching is true. Ephesians 4.14 the, That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. If your life is constantly in the tank, if your life is nothing but daily unhappy struggle and you cannot get peace and you keep battling the same sins over and over again and you keep feeling the same pull to the world or the same desires for worldly things and you can't understand why God won't give you those things, why he won't answer your prayers, why is, why is this like this and this like this and you're just constantly struggling and unhappy. If that sounds familiar, wipe that slate clean and start over. That is scriptural. Go into that word like a newborn baby and start again. Haley, bless her heart, had a terrible toothache last week. Y'all remember me asking for prayer. She was in agony. I mean, this is a mother of four that's delivered all four babies regular. She's um, had asthma all her life. She knows what it is to not be able to breathe. This is a woman who has endured physical hardship. But this tooth 
had her literally on her knees sobbing. And they started antibiotics, and then she couldn't get to the dentist because, they, you know, on Fridays, nobody's open on Fridays. And she finally, she called six dentists. Anyway, finally got in. The dentist dealt with the tooth, took care of it. But while she was going, I kept the kids. All of her children came and stayed, spent the night with us. We had a wonderful time. And Isaac, who was seven years old, he said, Granny, is there something I can do for you? And you got to know Isaac. Isaac is a servant. He has a servant's heart. And he said, Granny, what can I do for you? And I said, well, nothing, baby. I'm going to clean out my pantry today. That's my plan. He said, can I help you? I said, you absolutely can help me. He said, what do we need to do? So while I was cooking breakfast, he pulled up a chair in front of the pantry, and he started counting. He started counting cans and counting boxes, and he was making a list, and I thought, bless his heart. He doesn't know what to do, so he's just counting. Okay, there's three blue cans. There's four yellow boxes, and he's doing, just working so hard. And I got done. I said, I said, okay. I said, I'm ready to start on the pantry. He said, well, I, I, I've been counting everything. I said, that's great. I said, but the first thing, the first big thing we have to do is we have to take everything out of the pantry. Everything in there must come out. We have to sit it all around on the tables, on the counter, wherever we have to put it. And then we have to clean. We have to scrub down the shelves get the floor swept and mopped and, you know, just clean the whole thing out. And then we can start putting things back. Well, for three hours, and you got to understand, my pantry is full. For three hours, that little boy emptied the pantry. One or two things at a time. He got my stepladder stool. He climbed up on it to get to the upper shelves. He worked, and the only time he stopped was to have a sandwich. And he cleaned out that pantry. He worked at it while his siblings watched a um, little Bible story on TV, you know, or played in the garage or played outside. Isaac worked. And he worked and he worked and he worked. And um, so that's what I'm telling you. The first thing you have to do is to go back and clean everything out. When Paul and I made our lifestyle changes, when we had gotten to a place where we realized, yeah, we knew a lot of biblical truth, we knew a lot of scripture, but it somewhere along the line, things had not borne the fruit that it should have borne in our lives. So what we did was we got every Bible, we put it on a shelf, we got our old original Bibles, he got his, I got mine, we started sitting down and we began to examine everything. We started in Genesis. We went through the entire Bible, examining every concept that we, the Holy Spirit brought to us, saying, okay, what does the Bible say about this? We did some word studies. What does the Bible say about faith? What does the Bible say about sacrifice? What does the Bible say about sanctification? We went through everything, emptied out the old and began to allow the Holy Spirit to put in the new. The Holy Spirit to choose what stayed in our spiritual pantry. And so once Isaac got everything out, everything, all the stuff was wiped down. You know, cobwebs up in the corner were cleaned out. Floor was, was swept and mopped and everything was clear. Pantry was empty. And I'm not saying that spiritually you have to go down to empty. But if, if life has become that out of order, maybe you do need to go back to empty. Maybe you need to do like Paul and I did and just say, okay, everything is up for question. Get in the scripture and refill. I know. I know it sounds nuts. But let me tell you, I want to be victorious in this life. I don't want to be the world's kind of victorious. I want to be God's kind of victorious. You know, I always, you know, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And, and boy, we're just going to pray for you and anoint you and, 
I mean, we're going to bathe you in oil if we have to. And we're going to believe God. And, you know, if you die, we're going to resurrect you from the dead. Signs and wonders will follow those that believe. And guess what? People still die. Lazarus died. Again. Jesus raised him from the dead, but he died again and stayed dead that time. There are reasons for everything that God does. And they're not necessarily the reasons that we want to believe they are. We want to believe that God will move mountains so we can be happy. That's not why God moves mountains. God moves mountains to grow your faith. So that when the mountain doesn't move, you will still hold on. There's a reason for everything. There's a reason why relationships in your life never seem to be healed. Maybe a sibling or a parent or whatever, there's a reason. And you may not understand that reason. And you may work day in and day out for that person to love you and be your friend and be your buddy. And they still don't want to be. And that doesn't sound right because God is the God of reconciliation. He wants to restore relationships. Why won't you do this, God? But God knows what you do not know. You know, Joseph of Arimathea, was, was he a Sadducee or a Pharisee? I can't remember, but y'all know who I'm talking about. I believe he had a relationship with Jesus where the rest of them didn't. They were vipers. But he had developed some kind of relationship with Jesus, right? Didn't make sense why the rest of them couldn't see that. And I'm sure that Joseph of Arimathea thought the same thing. Why can't y'all see who this man is and what he is and that he is the Messiah? And why can't my buddies in the was it Sanhedrin, maybe? I don't remember. Why can't they see what I see? Why is there always going to be turmoil and, and struggle? Why can't they understand the truth? Because I want them to be part of my life. I want them to be my friend and buddy and come and have tea with me. But there's a reason for things like that. And, and when we take our eyes off the, our worldly understanding of why this is not good for us, potatoes, potatoes are so delicious. For a lot of people, they're healthy, but they absolutely destroy me. And I'm not kidding. They destroy me. I love them. Mashed potatoes, oh, I love it. But it is poison to me. Poison. There's a lot of things that look good, but they're poison to us as followers of Christ. So before you allow those things to have a place in the spiritual pantry of your life, ask God if they're good for you. Don't ask your buddy. Don't ask your friend. Ask God. Now, ladies, if you have a godly husband that is in Scripture and, and all of that, you know what? Ask him. But I'm going to tell you a little secret about husbands. Are y'all listening? Tune your ears to my little bit of wisdom about husbands. Most husbands just want their wives to not be mad at them. Most husbands just want their wife to like them and be happy and smile and give them a little hug every now and then, a little kiss, and be sweet and happy. That being said... If there's something in our life that we're not happy about as far as spiritual sacrifice and we have made that known 
to our husband. And then we go to that husband and say, Honey, now tell me honestly, what do you think the Lord wants me to do about this situation? I, I would safely say almost all of them will say what you want to hear because they don't want you to be mad at them. They're not stupid. Because let's face it, when we get mad, we can be mad a long time. Now, you all know, based on my life and my belief in the Word of God, we don't cut our hair. You can't see our hair because the Lord tells us to cover it. But the women in our family don't cut our hair. So our hair is very long. Very, very long. Now, if I started complaining day in and day out about how hard it was to take care of my hair, how my hair was so heavy it was weighting my head back and giving me terrible headaches, and and my husband came home in the afternoon and he says, Honey, how are you doing today? Oh, I, I'm just terrible. I've got this horrible headache. This hair is so heavy. It's just ruining my life. I hate it. Or, you know, I've got this gray hair and it just makes me feel so old and I just wish I could color it or something. Honey, do you think it's sinful to color my hair? Honey, do you think it's sinful if I just cut my hair a little bit? There's a few men that would turn around to that wife and say, No, the scripture says, don't cut your hair. Ah. <sighs> That man is not stupid. He knows what's coming after that. So ladies, realize that if your husband, a godly man who is trying to obey the word, encourages something in your life that you really deep down in your heart know is inappropriate for a godly woman, and he agrees that it's okay, don't fool yourself into thinking that you're gonna get away with it spiritually. Now that I, I know, I know that's I know that's whew, that's one of those that folks get mad about. But let me tell you, I just feel compelled to tell you. Your husband is not a stupid man. He does not want to make you mad. Now my husband and I have been married a good long time and he is a godly man and there are some things like that that I know he would still, he wouldn't tell me to go against the word of God, but if it's iffy, he, he, <laughs> he will listen to my argument and, and say, okay, well, you know, whatever you need to do. But thankfully on the big stuff, he doesn't do that. But ask yourself before you ask your husband, have I made this where it's impossible for my husband to tell me the truth? Am I not liking what my husband says and I'm punishing him for telling me the truth? Has he fear in his heart when I come to him for an opinion and he's trying to figure out what I want him to say? Yeah. 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 4. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Think about what you're accepting into your spiritual walk. Bless you. Oh, I see Haley said, Woo, amen, and Robin, I needed this. Hey, baby. I need this too. I go back over this stuff every week and I, I listen to it again and I think, oh Lord, I just, 
I just told the absolute truth about myself on there and everybody heard it. I need it too. <laughs> I need it too. Uh, okay. I'm already past time. Uh, I, see, I talk too much. I don't have that much more, so I'm gonna keep going. Filling up your pantry. Do not overspend. Luke 14, 28 through 30. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Why am I including that scripture? I'm including that scripture because I have... Now, this is not something I do. I'm just, I, I'm just not wired this way, but I know that some women are, so I'm sharing this little spark of truth. If you're the kind of woman who's going to clean out her pantry and she's going to go spend... $200 on matching canisters. So every little thing in there is going to match perfectly. And now she's not necessarily going to use them, but she just wants it to look really good. I knew a lady one time that said she could never live in a log cabin. You, you remember years ago when log cabin kits were being sold and they were really very inexpensive and we were talking about it back then. She said, oh, I could never live in a log cabin. And I said, why is that? She said, because I'd have to have all the stuff. I'd have to have everything that's perfect for a log cabin. So I'd have to sell everything I have and buy all new. And I said, well, that's sad that you couldn't just enjoy the log cabin. And, and you know, slowly over years make things different, you know, as you replace times. Oh, no, 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 no. I'd have to have everything brand new. And I, there's no way we could afford it. And I've, I've thought about that many times, examining my own life. Am I that way about things? But if you are, are the kind of person that has to get all the paraphernalia in place before you can function in something, you're not going to be a real happy person. You're going to be taking your eyes off the plan that God has for you and putting it on the plan you have for you, the way you see it, the image you've decided on, the picture you've set up, and that's not going to end well. Usually, when we come up with an image, like people say, well, you know, yeah, I want to be a homemaker and all, but I can't be Ozzie and Harriet, and, and see, now I wonder if people even know who Ozzie and Harriet are, but you know, the Leave it to Beaver, and she always had the perfect little starch dress and the beautiful little apron and her hair fixed in her little pearl earrings on and little pearl necklace and all that. And it was all perfect. And even when the little boy made some disaster, within just like five minutes, it was fixed. That's not real. That's not real. But the things and the criteria the Lord has established for us as daughters of God and as women serving Him that process is real. The way that looks is real. If you work outside the home, but your heart's cry is to be a homemaker, God will work that out for you if you commit yourself to it. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be a breeze. It, it isn't. There have been many times, and I've never, ever in... 40 years, I have never had to work outside our home except like to help somebody. Like, you know, I've gone up to the preschool for Sarah and worked a couple of days when she had to be off to do something. You know, that sort of thing. But I've never had to earn a paycheck outside our home leaving my children. And I've heard when they've said to me, Wow, you are just so blessed. I, you're so lucky. I'm not lucky. I am blessed. But don't think for one minute I had to do, didn't have to do without a lot of stuff. I've ha I have had to do without a lot of things that most women have. My children have had to do without things. 
But I, I guarantee you, every one of my children, if you ask them if they would have rather had it the other way around, every one of them would say, absolutely not. There is nothing better when you have less than $5 in your bank account and you can't go anywhere. You are out of gas until the next paycheck, but you pack up literally bread and bologna, loaf bread, not even French bread, loaf bread and bologna, and put it all in wax paper because you don't even have Ziploc bags, and you pack it all. Everybody gets their own little bag, and they put their bologna sandwich in there, and you can't buy a Coke. All you've got is Kool-Aid, and you put Kool-Aid in little a pint mason jars, and you pack it all up, and you head out into the woods, and you're walking, and you're talking, and you're singing, and you're having fun, and you find a little clear spot and you sit down with your kids and everybody's got a little spot to sit and you eat your, your sandwiches and drink your your water we all want our kids to have everything wonderful but the world's idea of everything wonderful and God's idea of wonderful are vastly different. Ladies, if you're being called to go home and be with your children, go home. It is scriptural to do that. Go home and be with your children Nobody can raise them better than you can. Examine those things that have been stored up in your heart. Get rid of the things that are lies from the pit of hell and replace those with the truth. The last point I wanted to share was don't shop when you're hurried, emotional, tired, or hungry. Don't take on big spiritual truths when you're in chaos. <laughs> Haley wrote wonderful sweet memories that I value so much more than anything. I've ever done without. They are good memories, aren't they, baby girl? <laughs> Proverbs 21, 5. I know you did, Linda. I, I can tell you were one of those who just, your heart was at home. I understand. And listen, if your kids are grown and that part of your life is done, don't feel guilty. You cannot go back and undo that. But you can be a voice for the young women of today. Just remember that. You can be a voice to encourage them. Don't, don't let the devil make you feel guilty over stuff that happened way back that you cannot change. Okay? Proverbs 21.5 The thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness, but of everyone that is hasty, only to want. If you are diligent... And if you are determined, you're looking toward the goal of better. If you're in a rush, you're, you're hurried, you're emotional, you're stressed, you're just looking at what you don't have, what you lack. Change your focus. Look toward the prize of the high calling. Right? Don't look at the failure. We all fail. That's why we have Jesus. Because we all fail. Look toward the prize. Work toward... Actually, Sarah said something. Paul's message Sunday morning was about sin and what sin actually is. And Sarah said afterwards, after church is over and we cut off the camera and we're all just sitting around discussing, Sarah said, you know, when you focus on all that you, you were doing wrong, it's nearly impossible to focus on what's right. 
And she said, so you literally have to turn your eyes and focus on this is where I'm going and stop looking back at where you failed. So, so ladies, remember that, remember that. Focus on the goal, not on the failure. But don't keep drawing back to the failure. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Focus on him. Before we start Wednesday night Bible study with the kids, we do, we do this little thing. Zip your lip. Thinking cap on. Focus on God. The kids do it all the time, no matter what. Zip your lip. Stop talking. Hush. Think about what's going on. Think about what the plan is. Think about what's important. And focus your eyes on God. That makes all the difference. The last little thing I had was remember your goals. Write it down. Habakkuk 2, 2 through 3. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. A lot of us know the concept of writing a diary, right? Go to bed at night, you write down all the stuff you did during the day. Write a diary, a journal. But think about, what if it was reversed? What if instead of writing things after they happened, we write a page every morning saying where we're focusing that day? That's why a lot of us read devotionals in the morning, because they set us to focus on a new thing today. But what if you did that yourself? Before you go to the grocery store, you write a list. You check your pantry. You see where something is lacking. You write your list, and that's what you shop for. What about in your spiritual walk if every day or at night you wrote for what's coming? Lord, I, I see a weakness here, and I realize that the devil's going to attack me here, or my flesh is going to get a hold here, and I'm going to use this scripture and this scripture and this scripture or this biblical character to help me remember what I need to do when that attack comes. That would be a powerful journal. And I'm going to close there. I love you all. Next week, let me just tell you, it's going to be good because when this, when the Lord said, okay, this is what I want you to focus on, I said, are you sure? And he said, yep. <laughs> and you know, Suzanne and I talked about one time, said, you know, do you really believe that God is like speaking to you constantly? I believe the Holy Spirit draws us and I believe the Holy Spirit shows us things in the earth. Like, you know, the first dandelion of the season. I can get an entire, entire message from the Word of God based on the very first dandelion that comes out of the crack in the concrete. You know what I'm saying? So, the Holy Spirit is not audibly speaking to me ever. I don't know that God has ever audibly spoken to me. He has given me visions. I've seen things spiritually that were unexplainable, but they were all confirming the Word. And when I when I'm looking at something or thinking about something, it's the word coming back to me. So when I say the Lord told me, he said, the phrase came up in my thoughts and the Lord said, okay, this is where I want that and this is what I'm talking about and this is where I want you to focus. That's the Lord speaking to me. I love you guys so much. I hope y'all have a most wonderful week. And um, look, don't get bogged down with the news, okay? Just cut the news off and listen to some praise and worship. You don't have to worry about what's going on in Washington. It's not that big a deal. God is in control of all that mess, okay? I love y'all. Bye-bye.